Okay, so uh, we, we just finished uh, the section talking about how to do a better uh, customer acquisition in different region experience, etc. So now we are having uh, Derek uh, from API Metrics. He is the CEO of the company. We'll be talking about how to build a trust framework uh, in the open banking API. So as, as we, we call in our day one, there's a lot of banks uh, representative talking about trust. So I think this is another in, uh, important topic. So um, how are you, Derek? I'm good. How are you, Patrick? Good evening yeah, from yeah, Seattle. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks again for our speaker in different time zone. I'm really uh, happy to have you to share in this uh, event. So uh, let's try to see your, your slide first. And then, uh, OK. OK, I can see your slide here. And then your voice is good. So I will give the time to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and, and it's uh, really exciting to follow that talk because I think uh, I'm going to touch on some of the uh, the concepts that you were just discussing, Patrick, about um, regulated API frameworks, and importantly, in my mind, trust. And uh, what trust means when you have regulated APIs that all the parties have to agree on and use, that have to be used in certain ways and have to be measured in certain ways. And uh, based on experience we've gained from working in multiple different regions in the UK with the OBU, OBIE um, framework in the US with the FDX framework, PSD2 in Europe and uh, the Australian ACCC, we've started to understand some of the challenges that are facing the banking industry. And I'm gonna talk about what those are and my thoughts on how we can address some of the critical ones that aren't technical, but they are critical for the success of open ecosystems. So I'm going to cover how trust applies to APIs in regulated ecosystems, how we measure and how we gain trust, and how we maintain that trust over time. Because um, particularly with uh, API networks and API systems, you can't just release and be done. Things will change over time. Things will evolve. Things will break. And we need to have common frameworks for understanding what that all means. So. Um, I think the expression from Mark Andreessen was software is eating the world, but actually APIs are how they're doing it. And as we explore the world of open everything, we're looking at ecosystems for uh, healthcare, for banking, for insurance. And in some respects, APIs have grown up. Um, there's a famous chart from Programmable Web that shows that the, the the increase in APIs over the last 10, 15 years has been essentially a straight line always going upwards. But in some respects, they've grown up. And it's most obvious in open banking where uh, governments are getting interested in services being provided that people can access the resources. And banks are actually seeing the benefits and the opportunities there. And actually, it's, it's creating opportunities for everyone. And I think the banks have seen what happened in the telecom space, that if you ignore the growth of APIs and you ignore the opportunity of open ecosystems, um, once profitable business lines like uh, short messaging services will disappear in um, a flurry of different systems like WhatsApp and so on. And they don't want that to happen. So, so it's in everybody's interest to understand what is being delivered and how. But before I get to that, I'm gonna talk about um, the API ecosystem in terms of being a restaurant and try and draw some comparisons with why it's actually, why we're missing out and what we're missing out on. And if I look at a restaurant ecosystem, you've actually got um, three distinct er areas of interest. You have the kitchen um, within the restaurant and you have equipment there, you have support staff, you have people who wash dishes, you have people who, um, supply the food, you have food, you have chefs, you have different chefs, you've got recipes, you've got meals, you've got things coming out of the kitchen, you have things going in. On the other side of the restaurant wall though, you have the front of house, you've got the bit that people go and sit in, and then you've got staff in there, you've got people who will seat you, you've got people who clear tables, um, you have the customers who are eating the meals. Uh, you have people who take the payments. You've got the person probably managing the entire business. And things are moving back and forth between the kitchen and the front of house. And then outside of that, you've got, you've got re restaurant reviewers. You've got critics. Um, you've got food inspectors. You've got oversight from external services outside of your control. 
um, the fire department, um, health, um, health and sanitation. And they'll review the quality of the report on issues. And finally, you've got suppliers who move things in and out for the front of house and the kitchen. So it's quite a complex ecosystem. Uh, people want to have trust in the kitchen. Do they have the tools and supplies to deliver what they want? Do you trust the food quality? How do you know the food quality is likely to be good? Will you get food poisoning? Um, you've also got to trust in performance. Do you get seated quickly? Do you get your drink? Do you get the food in time? Uh, if the food arrives, is it the food you ordered? Uh, and is it cold when it arrived? Um, these are all things that impact people's perception of things. And then there's expectations and delivery. Um, McDonald's is a restaurant, or at least it calls itself a restaurant, but so is the Michelin three-star restaurant, the Fat Duck in Bray, um, from fellow Brit, Heston Blumenthal. They're both restaurants, but the experience and the cost you will have in eating at the Fat Duck or any high-end restaurant is different from eating at a fast food takeout place. So you need to align expectations and understand what everybody's going to be working to. And I actually see this as very similar to the situation we have with the API ecosystem. So um, in lieu of the kitchen, we have the technical staff, we have developers. And there's a lot of focus on developers, the technical standards they use, the technology stacks they employ, the tooling uh, like Postman or Stoplight or other tools, and the monitoring support technology they use to keep everything that they're interested in working. And on the other side of that, all the way across, we have compliance. You've got ma senior management teams, sourcing teams, regulators. They're all looking at the standards. They're looking at the con compliance. They want to have accurate and meaningful reporting that they can agree on with all of the parties they work with. And they want mechanisms for dispute resolution so that everybody can agree on how things work. And then caught in the middle of that, you've got users, you've got the people consuming the APIs, whether it's the end user or a third party building a financial services application, uh, or the directors and managers building applications or interacting with third parties, sometimes outside of their control. And they're, sort of, they're interested in how do you discover services? How do you manage the contracts? How do you get accurate usage and performance data? And essentially, I believe there's a trust gap between these parties that you have technical standards that are implemented, you have regulatory standards that are being put together by regulators, and you have the people who have to deliver to those services and understand what it is they have bought, what it is they're supplying, and how it's going to work on uh, a day-to-day -day basis. And that's essentially uh, what we're trying to, what I'm trying to address and what I'm interested in conceptually for open banking. So. Talking about some barriers to trust, like, just to explain what I mean by that. Um, one of them is aligning expectations. And in engineering, which is where I started, we call these parallax errors, where you can look at exactly the same thing, but the way you look at it can impact what number or what metrics you see. Um, the most common example that's taught to young engineers is a thermometer, that if you look straight on at the temperature, you will see a different number than if you're looking down at an angle. Um, that's uh, one example. And we see this with APIs in terms of how you measure performance. If you measure from inside your stack, you'll get very different numbers to somebody measuring from where they use it. And we particularly see this um, outside of banking in a lot of internet applications, where if you measure their performance from Hong Kong, for example, you'll get completely different metrics for if you measure it in Virginia in the, on the East Coast of the US. But another example with that is back to my expectation setting. There's a huge difference between a set of McDonald's French fries and some triple cooked chips, which are a personal favorite of mine, in uh, served in a very high end restaurant. So um, they're both the same thing. They're both made from the same product, but they have a completely different taste and feel. Uh, I'm British. If I put this into uh, Chinese food, exp um, Visions, um, I'm a huge fan of uh, crispy aromatic duck, which is a huge childhood favorite of mine. Uh, but in North America, they serve Peking duck and don't understand why it's not the same for me. So it's they're both duck, they're both Chinese food, they're both completely different things. Um, so we have the same issues with APIs. Um, 
it can sometimes be as simple as confusion. People ordering things and not knowing what they ordered or what they expected to get. Uh, I used to work in France, and every summer we, there would be lots of tourists, and they would order steak tartare, which is essentially raw ground beef with a raw egg in it, and they would send it away to be cooked because they thought it was ham a hamburger, because the ground meat translates as hamburger to Americans. So these are uh, it's a simple thing, but it's an example of how we look at things in different ways and end up with different expectations. And that goes against having trust in how things work. So how does this manifest itself in APIs? The first one is documentation. Um, there can be too much. It can be impossible to find out what you're trying to see. Often it's more that it's too little and sometimes it's just plain wrong. Um, it can be painfully badly written. Uh, it can be presented in ways people can't use it. Uh, we have lots of tools like Swagger, Spotlight, Postman. Things that allow us to define APIs, but it's 2021. We still see banks issuing documentation in PDF format. So you can't even accurately or reliably cut and paste the essential URLs or resources you need in order to be able to make the API calls. And human error can happen in these systems. Um, they could be prepared wrong. There can be spelling mistakes in them. There can be typos in critical code sections, particularly if the documentation was written by somebody not involved in the delivery of the APIs themselves. And that goes back to my um, different silos that we have in the delivery frame that the people who are responsible for one thing may be not the people responsible for other parts of it. And finally, documentation just ages badly. Um, it doesn't take many changes for documentation to be out of date, and it's frequently the last thing to be updated because the developers who build the APIs aren't necessarily the people who are going to put them together or make them work. So the other section, and this was touched on the last talk, was about regulatory or business barriers to access. And this is, um, this is becoming more and more relevant in open banking that we're seeing regulators like the ACCC in Australia, like OBIE in the UK, they're defining how you get access to services and they're acting as gatekeepers. So in order to access banking services, you must meet their requirements. But then you get other regulatory frameworks where in other countries where those that central source of issuing credentials is actually handled on essentially a bipartisan, bilateral agreement between provider and recipient. So if you're trying to integrate to lots of banks in the US, you actually have to go to each bank individually and sign up with that bank, pass that bank's entry criteria, and then build to their API sets. And even things like the FDX stand in North America isn't resolving that problem. It's making it easier to write one set of code, but you still need to get credentialed by each individual bank. And that's a huge barrier to entry. Um, other problems, uh, people, before they'll give you the credentials, you can use sandboxes. But a lot of times, the sandboxes are not representative of the APIs being used. Um, in the example of the United Kingdom, OB UK specified sandboxes were to be provided by the banks, but they was provided before they'd finished building their API stacks. So you ended up with sandboxes that use different security, if they use security at all, and often worked completely differently to the APIs that came later. So you could build a solution to the sandbox using all of the features in the sandbox and still end up with something that didn't work. So that's a huge problem for anybody creating financial services solutions. It very much helps if there's a central authority who will issue credentials that everybody can use for all of the providers. And if you don't have that, you'll see there's a huge overhead of how you actually get credentialed and into systems. A final part, and I, this is where um, I, we see the most problems day to day, and my company monitors APIs for banks and third-party financial service providers. And it's that people often have a particular tool or monitoring system that they like or they're very invested in, and it's that they have a desire to use it. And I, I call this my precious 
um, that there's a natural desire from everybody to have one tool or one set of metrics um, that do all the monitoring and data collection for them for literally everything they could possibly ever want to measure. And it's perfectly natural. If you're a bank and you've spent half a million dollars or more on your complete app dynamics suite for all of your infrastructure, you want to get as much money um, value for money out of that as possible. But the problem is, the reason these tools exist and have grown up is they originally were for a specialist task. And you need to have specialist tools for specialist things. If you're not measuring from where your end users are and the people who work with your systems, you are not going to be able to um, agree on what it is you're measuring. So what we often see with banks and banking services in particular is a third part, trusted third party will believe the bank is down, the bank will believe they're up, and the two parties will present themselves to the regulator in their region prove, with proof that the other one is lying. And it's very hard for a regulator who are often very non-technical to sit and arbitrate between two groups who have brought proof the other one is incorrect. And how we're seeing this manifest itself in the UK market is third parties are not trusting the metrics that are being published by the regulator. They're not trusting the metrics published by the providers and they're doing their own measurements. And there are so many financial services providers doing so many measurements of their own that they're actually impacting the overall performance of the ecosystem. Uh, we've heard stats that uh, in terms of consent flows, this can be um, causing problems for the providers by doing so many calls. And without consistent approaches to measuring that, nobody can agree on how things work and how they look. So what does this, bringing this all together, what does it mean? And there are things we should do anyway, and there are things that we should agree to do the same way all the time. And I'll talk about the things you should do anyway that are easy because everything exists out there for you to do them. And then I'll talk about some things that I'm hoping as an industry we put together so we can agree on how to do some things all the same way all the time and avoid the expectation problems and the parallax errors, which I talked about at the start of my talk. So things we can do all do. Uh, we can use standard specifications and document what we do. There are so many tools for that, and they're very good. Uh, people should use open API specs. You can use Postman. You can use Stoplight for your documentation. Um, Swagger UI. You, there are lots of products you can use for that. Uh, another tip is once you've built a solution and you have your solution out there, get humans who have never seen your APIs before to read your documentation on board with them. You will not be, believe how many times that brings up things that your internal teams missed. It's much like proofreading your own work. You'll always miss the errors unless you have a fresh pair of eyes. Track changes and make sure you recheck them regularly. Nothing worse than changing something and not documenting it so people are building to an old specification. And then measure from the place the third parties work from. There are lots of tools for that. Our sales API metrics. Postman has monitoring. Um, Sometimes it doesn't work with the security, but there are ways around that. Uh, Checkly also does the same thing, but measure externally the key flows from where people are. But what's missed out? Well, the first thing is agreement on what and how we measure. We should always measure in production. Um, there's lots of problems with this. We're fully aware of that, but you should always use production, real production accounts in the production environment you should also always measure from the outside in as if you were a third party, and you should agree in advance to measure the same things in the same way. If you're using a latency, are you using the median? Are you using the P95 value? Are you using the P99? Following on from that, parties in dispute need to have somebody outside the delivery chain to mediate. You can't have your infrastructure vendors or partners or people involved in the delivery of commercial services working on those things. And we need agreement on what, what good means and what bad means within those open eco ecosystems that everybody can sign up for. In my view, uh, and this is a small plug for what I'm trying to do for the in, in the industry, we need a ratings agency for APIs. We need independent standard setting for what is good and what is not,
that covers technology delivery and, regula and regulations. And it needs to provide standard techniques for measurement, guidelines, processes that we can all follow, best practices for the documentation and service delivery, and a methodology for supporting disputes. Um, I'm planning to announce this next week. We've already got um, many um, major companies from around the API ecosystem, not just in finance, who are interested. Uh, John Musser from Ford, Lorinda Brandon from Better Cloud. Uh, we're going to be announcing some participants from the financial services space, some from uh, Don Thibault, for, uh, formerly of the OPID Foundation from Banking Security. This is an essential part of how I see the future of the ecosystem working. And what we're trying to do is bring some semblance of structure and order to that. And then finally, a slightly bigger plug, um, our day-to-day -day work is monitoring APIs and trying to get people to um, not do that in a vacuum or hide the data. So if you want to check out API Expert, we have public data on over 2,000 APIs from 160 providers. And we're always looking for partners and new APIs to onboard. And my belief is uh, API performance data is not, should not be private. It should not be hidden. And people should own up to the problems they're having and make sure it's the data is presented in a meaningful, fully transparent, and agreed upon way so everybody understands how things work. So thank you. Um, that was my presentation. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, pleasure talking to you. Yep, okay, thanks David uh, to share about the trust framework uh, from your point of view. So uh, yeah, so uh, he comes to some some questions. So you do also mention that it's a very typical story. So when this issue happened, etc., uh, maybe the provider will, will share some figures and then the consumer will, will not be trust and vice versa. There's a very typical thing. So um, you also share some um, thoughts about how the API provider should do, for example, the the open API specification, etc., to adopt that. Um, but uh, in in Hong Kong, I can see that uh, there's quite some of the potential part we call TSP, want to part with the banks. And then the challenge is how they can gain trust as a third party part, maybe as a consumer that can that can they are appropriate to uh, consume those API. So do you have any quick suggestion from the API consumer perspective? How can they build their trust before before they they engage some big API provider partner? Um, I, I think the, I mean, I think the key to trust is transparency and being open about performance and data, and that comes down to us as an industry setting some standards that we agree to adhere to. Um, I see it, it; it's like um, buying any product. Um, there's a degree of magic we've created around technology and APIs, in particular, that they're not like other things; that they're not, uh, they're not tangible. But a lot of people wouldn't buy a, um, a car or they wouldn't buy a even a TV without doing some basic checks on, is this a good one? Is this a bad one? Even if it's just what the what is the price, they'll you at least go and do some comparisons and decide what you want. I think we need to get into the habit of doing that around APIs and actually understanding if a certain service or, that we depend on or is critical for delivery of what we're consuming isn't actually very good. We need to actually understand that before we get too far down the route of having it. Um, the way this manifests itself often in financial services delivery is a third party builds an application. They tie in through another to, uh, set of APIs to a number of providers. If one of the provider's APIs are very bad, the provider's APIs don't get blamed for being bad. The application you're looking at on your phone is what gets blamed for being bad. And it's in your interest then as the provider of that application not to get caught out by the fact that AN Bank or XY credit card actually have a terrible service because consumers won't mind. They will always blame you. And I think we, we need to get into that habit of verifying what it is we're putting in and having mechanisms to protect yourself both as a consumer of a service but also as the provider of a service that's got lots of different sections to it that you can actually say we are having problems with this service this system today and it's not us 
Okay, got it, got it. So talking about uh, the transparency, so uh, we also have some uh, talk and, and also some experience sharing with some community members. So uh, quite a lot of them is worrying about disclosing their issues. But of course, we, we know that as a technical person, we are transparent and then, okay, we, we are improving, improving, improving. But uh, in the financial services or regulated industries, it seems that a bit um, uh, sensitive. So do you have any quick lesson learned or some example that, okay, how, how can we respond to uh, some uh, Issues uh, when you, when we go uh, going to those uh, transparency angle. Do you have any interesting story to share? I, I I think the the I think that the it's perfectly natural. People don't like yeah. um, sharing their dirty laundry in public. Uh, they worry yeah. about it. Um, but I I think if we look at the experience in the UK, which is the most evolved open banking regime on earth at the moment, they're between twelve and eighteen months ahead of everybody else, and when when we as api metrics first started monitoring for banks they didn't want to monitor their production environments they didn't want to do it for real they didn't want anybody seeing the data and then they started to realize that they were getting into fights over things they knew weren't their fault and if they were hiding things they were just making life worse for themselves so actually we now supply five of the seven largest banks in the U in britain and they've got very into the idea of actually, we want to share this data. We want this data to be out there because if it isn't, we don't know how well we're doing. We don't know how well we're working with other groups. And we don't even, we, if we don't have an agreed set of actually talking to ourselves, we can't talk to anybody else about what we're doing. And I think it's, it's an education thing. And I think if you talk to the CIOs of the larger banks in private, they actually want to know if somebody else thinks that they've got problems. Because the last thing they want is to find out when a regulator phones them and says, um, we've got a complaint about you and we are going to uphold it. And I think the banks need to understand that it's not happened yet, but at some point in the next five years, there will be real world consequences to not taking this seriously. And I think that's an education that we should all be doing across the ecosystem. But yes, it's very natural, but I'm I'm very much uh, I, I I think um, bright sunlight always disinfects things. Yep. Okay. So, uh, thanks, David, for your sharing and also some some uh, uh the, the talk about the UK situation as well. Okay. So uh, thanks I, I, a lot for your support to the event. So it is almost time for the lunch breaks. So thanks for fun. Thanks for your support. So see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, David.